Good morning and welcome back to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are um, gathering this morning to take a first look um, at a proposed constitutional amendment and a couple of resolutions that have been uh, assigned to our committee. Um, this is an opportunity to familiarize and re-familiarize ourselves with uh, this important uh, work. And we will definitely come back to hear other perspectives on all of these things. Um, I would note for committee members, as well as for folks following along that um, we have uh, we've received some emails uh, with respect to a couple of these issues um, from, uh, from different perspectives. So would welcome folks to um, keep an eye out for those messages that are coming from Vermonters. Uh, so the first thing that we are going to do is take a look at the proposed constitutional amendment. And um, Amarin, for the benefit of the committee uh, members who are new to government operations uh, and or new to the legislature, it would be helpful to have you remind us um, the various steps in the process of amending our Vermont constitution. Uh, and then maybe you can take us through the language uh, that we are uh, looking at here and uh, we'll need to approve in order to amend our constitution. So welcome, Amron, and thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Amron Averjali, Legislative Council. In terms of process, the process for amending the Vermont Constitution is specified in Chapter 2, Section 72 of the Vermont Constitution. The Senate proposes an amendment to the Constitution. It must be approved by two-thirds of the Senate. Then the House must concur in that uh, proposed amendment, and that would happen in one biennium. Uh, once the House concurs, that a uh, proposed amendment is then referred into the next biennium. Uh, we are presently in that second biennium for this proposal. And the Senate and House must both uh, approve the amendment, uh, the proposed amendment to the Constitution. There cannot be any changes to the proposed amendment uh, during the first or second biennium. It is once it is proposed, that is the proposed language that. Uh, everyone must approve or disapprove. So for this proposed amendment, uh, this was proposed by the Senate in 2019. It was concurred in uh, by the House in 2020. It was referred into this biennium and the Senate has uh, approved the proposed amendment this session and now it has been uh, now it is with the House, where the House will determine whether to concur in the proposed amendment. At that point, if both uh, houses approve the amendment, the proposed amendment this year, then it will go to the voters in the 2022 election. If approved by a majority of voters in the 2022 election, then the Vermont Constitution will have been amended. So that is the process. Are there any questions on process before I move into the substance? Looks like one question, at least. Um, yep. Go right ahead, Rep. Behovsky. Thanks. Um, with the voter approval, is that a simple majority or does that also need to be a two-thirds majority? Simple majority. Thank you. Representative Mawicki. Um, thank you, Amron. And just, just to reflect what you said to make sure I heard you right. Um, these are up and down votes. We cannot amend them. We cannot change any of the language in this. It's just an up or down vote. That is correct. Thank you. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Amarin, uh, for the listening public as well, um, the uh, ballot issue, my understanding is it has, does it have to be spelled out exactly as it is in the proposal that we're looking at? That is a good question. I will need to circle back on that. My assumption would be yes, but I don't 
no, and I don't want to speculate. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Amarin. Yeah, that would You're that, that would be uh, that would be good to know because I almost think that it, it, I almost think there was an issue with the previous one uh, uh, in regards to you know seventeen year olds being able to vote if they turned eighteen by the time of the general election in the primary. So, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know as though that wording was exactly as um, the wording uh, that that was proposed uh, by us, but anyway, it would be. I think it'd be interesting to know. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. So, um, committee members, if you can call up the language of Prop Two, um, and Amron, it shouldn't take us long to go through um, the the wording of the proposed constitutional amendment. Certainly, I wanted to add one last uh, process step that I forgot that is in between uh, this going on the ballot, uh, which is that the, the governor has to issue a proclamation to provide public notice of the proposed constitutional amendment. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that that was, that that was in there. Also, in case uh, anyone is interested, there was there was a lot of testimony and materials when this proposal first was in the Senate in 2019. I'd be happy to provide the committee with links so they can review the materials and testimony from witnesses uh, if that would be helpful. I think that would be helpful. Representative Behovsky. Thanks. I want to be clear. I'm not in any way suggesting this might happen. I just very much like to understand the process of things. But if it passes out of the Senate and out of the House, can the governor choose not to issue that proclamation and stop that in its tracks? Or is it just sort of, no, he can't. Okay, thanks. All right. I think right. Ricky's hand is up from before. So let's go to okay. the language. All right. This is proposal two as passed by the Senate in 2019. Section one purpose. This proposal would amend the constitution of the state of Vermont to clarify that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. This would amend article one of chapter one of the Vermont constitution so that it now reads, you'll see the, the header of article one is changed to say slavery and indentured servitude prohibited. The second uh, half of this first paragraph is uh, repealed. Uh, this language previously said, no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving to the age of 21 years and less bound by the person's own consent after arriving to such age or bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. And so the uh, proposal would amend this language so that it would now say uh, that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights, amongst which are the enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Therefore, slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. Section three is the effective date. The amendment set forth in section two shall become part of the constitution of the state of Vermont on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November, 2022, when ratified and adopted by the people of this state in accordance with provisions, with the provisions of title 17, chapter 32. Any questions from committee members? So we spent some time um, on this in our committee in the last biennium as well. Um, heard from um, a number of witnesses just in order to understand uh, the the history behind this and um, and the implications of what it means to make this amendment to our constitution. Um, and so you can review a lot of. Uh, a lot of what we did for work on this in the 2020 uh, session, I think it was back in January, so it was pre-YouTube uh, pre streaming, 
pre-pandemic, uh, but there are still a number of supporting documents on our committee page from the last biennium. Um, so would welcome you all to, to look over that material and we will come back to this uh, in more detail. Any other questions about Prop 2? Uh, go ahead, Representative Lefebvre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we recall what the vote of this was? That is a good question. I am quite sure it was unanimous out of committee, but I don't recall what the vote was on the floor. Quite strong. Thank you. That was my recollection as well, Madam Chair, is that I don't recall anybody voting against it, committee or floor. Um, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Emeryn, I, I don't know what used word to use, but this is not window dressing, but it's filling in a gap that is perceived. But in, in the context of actual law and prosecution at this point, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, the nail salon cases that were up here in Chittenden County, um, uh, indentured servitude, if that's what it actually is, is already covered by civil and criminal law, right? I am not an expert on criminal law, so I, I'm afraid I don't have an answer for you there. I, as you'll see in some of the materials from when this was reviewed previously, there is case law history from the time that this uh, section was first part of the Constitution that suggests that it it should be read as prohibiting slavery and indentured servitude, um, and the one of the reasons for striking the the latter half of that paragraph is that it it creates confusion, um, and so I would need to check with my legislative counsel counterparts in criminal law which I can do if you would like um, to see what uh, no, they, prohibitions there are. But my understanding yeah. is that, that functionally, this does not change how the state of Vermont operates. This is simply to make sure that the constitution is clear on its face and in its wording. Thank you. Yep. And no, I don't want you to go anywhere <laughs> and do anything. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions on Prop 2? All right, um, next we are going to reverse what's printed in our agenda in order to take up JRH4 because we have um, United States uh, shadow senator from DC with us this morning. Um, senator Strauss, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Welcome to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we have not yet looked at the language of the proposed resolution urging Congress to admit Washington DC to the union as a state. Um, but I would love to invite you to share your perspective um, uh, just to enlighten us before we look at the language. Welcome. Well, I, appreci I, I appreciate this opportunity, Madam Chair, and thank you so much for the courtesy. Um, Yesterday, the U.S. House passed the, uh, the bill that would admit us as a state. Um, it, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, with you today. Uh, I have enjoyed the, the many uh, uh, times I've, I've had a chance to visit your state, particularly as the father of a recent UVM graduate. Uh, we missed the ceremony last year in person, but uh, uh, I love coming up to Vermont. I love the people of Vermont. Uh, and the support of the Vermont House is important. One, we already have your senators on the bill, uh, so it's not necessarily as critical for that, but uh, you are one of the states that actually has fewer people than we do. And so uh, we call you out a lot uh, for that. 
Uh, and nobody is suggesting that you don't deserve the rights of a state. Of course you do. We would just like those same rights. And so because of that, uh, Vermont is in a unique position to show its support uh, for our admission. Uh, it is consistent with democratic values, and I mean small d democratic values, that Washington, D.C. residents who pay full federal taxes, serve in the military, serve their country in so many ways, including civilian service. I mean, one of my constituents is a, a doctor named Anthony Fauci, and he's certainly been doing his part uh, working in government and public service. But most D.C. residents have nothing to do with the federal government. Uh, we work in the private sector. Uh, the biggest source of our economy is tech. And we just want to take our place in the union. And at a time right now when we have so many problems as a nation, we really need all of us working together. And so the idea that D.C. statehood is somehow divisive in some ways is just ludicrous. Uh, if you were to kick the violins out of the orchestra, you wouldn't be punishing the string section. You'd be diminishing the quality of the music as a whole. And until our democracy has all of the instruments playing, all of the voices heard, uh, we as a nation suffer. The quality of our democracy is diminished. And so uh, I hope we can count on your support. Um, it is uh, a resolution that is largely symbolic, but it is an important symbol. And um, uh, we would, uh, particularly because your state comes up so often in, in our discussions, uh, and we mean that with all affection, uh, your support would be uh, strategically important to us as we go forward. So uh, I thank you for uh, accommodating my request, uh, but it was important to me that I um, made this case to you in person and, and hopefully had a chance to thank you in advance uh, because we look forward to you uh, marking it up and, and passing it. and. Uh, uh, we're, we're happy to follow up on language. If you go to a markup, we're not necessarily wedded to any uh, particular thing, but uh, the principle of uh, equality for all Americans is important. Thank you. Thank you so much for Zooming to Vermont today to, uh, to share some conversation with us. Um, I think it would be helpful for, uh, for you to explain a little bit about what your title means, given that you do um, have United States Senator, uh, but shadow Senator. And so help us understand uh, what that means functionally in terms of your participation in our federal government. Thank you so much. So. Uh, Shadow Senator is a nickname for my position. The legal name is actually United States Senator for the District of Columbia. When DC residents go to the polls on election day as they did this past 2020 general election, uh, on our ballot is a position called United States Senator. Uh, and I was a candidate and the Republican party put up uh, a candidate uh, and uh, our Green Party also put up a candidate. So I ran against the nominees of two other parties. And DC residents went to the polls and they voted the same way voters in every other state uh, with a Senate election up last year did. So the difference is after the election, I don't get to vote in the Senate and uh, advocate on my constituents' behalf the way uh, Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders do. And so uh, shadow is actually a term that originated in the British Parliament centuries ago. Um, if you're a fan of British parliamentary trivia, you'll note that there is a shadow foreign minister, a shadow chancellor of the exector. Uh, essentially what happens is the opposition forms a cabinet in waiting. And uh, the term carried over to the United States beginning with America's first shadow senators, uh, that were elected by the territory of what became Tennessee, where they elected senators in waiting who went on to advocate for statehood. Uh, California, Michigan, Minnesota have all used shadow senators in the 20th century. The territory of Alaska uh, elected senators in advance of statehood. And so it is one more thing we are doing to show that we are uh, ready for statehood. Uh, I've had the privilege of serving since my first election in 1996. I took over for Reverend Jesse Jackson. Uh, and throughout my entire tenure of service, uh, the senators from Vermont, um, beginning with Senator Jeffords, uh, Senator Sanders, and of course, consistently Senator Leahy have always been strong advocates 
uh, for the people of the District of Columbia. And we have appreciated that solidarity and friendship and we hope we can count on it one more time. And just uh, enlighten us for those of us who don't follow the details, how many uh, constituents do you represent? We have about 725,000 people right now in DC. We don't have the exact 2020 census numbers, but we have seen uh, a huge growth in population uh, over the past 10 years. Uh, there were times when we had a greater population than um, 10 states, but uh, among some other statistics besides population is we pay the highest federal taxes per capita in the nation. And we, despite our small geographic size and our relatively small population size, contribute more taxes in the aggregate to the federal treasury uh, than 22 states. <laughs> and so uh, we're certainly doing our fair share uh, and we just wanna uh, join the union on equal footing. Uh, and the bill, the stated bill, preserves a federally neutral seat of government. Uh, it will be uh, uh, largely where it is. We all got a glimpse of what the actual border would be, uh, tragically, as security fencing had to fence off that federal district for the recent inauguration. But uh, the tragic events of last year really made this much more of a priority uh, than it ever has been. First came the coronavirus spending bills where DC was treated like a territory and not a state. And so we only got one third of the resources that states got. Uh, but the virus didn't know we were a territory and not a state. And so it didn't make us only one third as sick or in fact, uh, two thirds fewer people. Uh, we had to battle it uh, on equal footing with the, without all the resources that the states got. And uh, the old justification was that somehow if the capital was located in a state uh, an angry mob could interfere and threaten and disrupt the proceedings of Congress. Well, hey, that happened, uh, sadly, on January 6th. And it was D.C. residents through our local police department and our local National Guard troops that were the first uh, to go and render aid to those federal authorities. Uh, we put our lives on the line for democracy that day uh, to protect a building that doesn't even allow its elected members of Congress and senators to vote in that body. And so we hope that we can uh, rectify that. Representative Colston has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and a pleasure to meet you, uh, Senator Strauss. Um, my question is, how would statehood impact the function of Washington, DC? How might it be different? Uh, it really would not be very different. What would happen to us, the biggest difference is that we, instead of our chief executive being called a mayor, uh, we would have a governor. Uh, and as we've learned in the last year or so, having a governor is really important. So when governors had to coordinate the coronavirus response, uh, getting our mayor on those calls was a challenge. Uh, a governor can call out the National Guard when they need to. A governor can stop a president from calling out the National Guard when we don't want them. And so we had two dramatic problems with not having a governor last year. One, Trump called out out-of-state Guard troops to basically occupy DC during the Black Lives Matter protests. He used those troops to violently clear peaceful protests so that he could take what's now become a notorious photo op at a church. Um, and then when we needed to get the Guard out quickly to respond to the problem at the Capitol, uh, it took hours and hours of federal bureaucratic delays as we had to go uh, through the secretary of the army and so forth. Uh, and that's not uh, good for anybody's public health or safety. Um, right now, there is an area in D.C. called the National Capital Service Area, and it is a purely federal district. Federal employees mow the lawn from the National Park Service on the National Mall. They pick up the trash. The police that patrol that area are either park police or capital police or secret service. They're all paid by the federal government. And then the surrounding area, it's us, the local DC pack payers that picks up the bill and supervises them. And so that is the part we're admitting is the 51st state. That national capital service area would remain a purely federal district under the exclusive jurisdiction of Congress. So if you went to the Smithsonian, you still wouldn't have to pay us any sales tax at the gift shop or anything like that. Um, but uh, our government structure would remain largely intact. Um, 
and all that would happen would be our non-voting members would be replaced with voting members. Uh, and uh, hopefully we, we could uh, uh, be a voice for, for more Americans. And um, right now the, the, the Senate is, is becoming, you know, less and less synonymous with really w w what people want. If you look at where the Senate is and certain polling on national issues, you see some big discrepancies. 18% um, of Americans are actually represented with 52 United States senators. And, um, you know, DC statehood would be a way to begin to sort of at least correct uh, that imbalance. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Strauss, for showing today and, and giving us uh, the information. Um, I have a couple of questions. I guess uh, my understanding is that the Constitution mandates a district to house the federal government. So uh, how what would happen there in that regard to that piece of the Constitution? Uh, it would remain intact and it would be followed to the letter. What would be changing are the boundaries of the federal district. So if you've, um, uh, as I said, there's an area right now that is purely federal. And then there's a huge part where uh, a population greater than your state now lives. That becomes the 51st state and the federal district gets smaller. And so uh, for those particularly conservatives that are Audrey's advocating making government smaller and shrinking the federal bureaucracy, we want to do just that. Right now, Congress spends a lot of time overseeing local DC affairs. Uh, members of the Senate uh, have to approve our local family court judges. It's a waste of their time and it slows up the effectiveness of our court system. So uh, the federal district uh, remains smaller, but uh, undisturbed. Congress is the sovereign as they are now. Uh, nobody lives there, so there would be nobody voting in any future elections. Uh, actually, I mean, there's one family in a, a big public housing project we call the White House, but uh, right now the occupant votes in Delaware. Uh, so there, there would really be no uh, uh, complications with it. And that section of the Constitution said that the district couldn't exceed 10 miles square, which was an old timey way of saying 100 square miles. We shrunk that to about 70 miles. Uh, we're going to shrink it uh, before we did that in 1846, when we returned Arlington and Alexandria back to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, that was actually due to protect the slave trading ports of Alexandria. It was an unfortunate example of history, but it did set a precedent that would allow us to enfranchise voters today by shrinking the seat of government to what's actually the federal district. And if I could, another question, uh, has there any, been any talk over the years about actually an, a simpler answer of dividing it up between Maryland and Virginia? Well, nobody really sees that as a simpler answer, certainly not Maryland, uh, you know, whose Republican governor is not necessarily excited about uh, having a whole bunch more uh, voters from out of state move into their district, not the Maryland residents that want to see their senatorial representation diluted. Um, you know, Vermont, I believe, was originally part uh, of another state. I don't think you guys want to go back. The state line that separated us from Maryland was carved out in 1790. Uh, that border has existed longer than most other states, including I think yours. Uh, and, and we just don't want to go back. And so uh, you could talk about the, the chicken and the egg and which came first, but uh, putting the egg back in the chicken is, is not going to be very uh, uh, helpful to the chicken and it's not going to be good to the egg. Uh, Maryland's a great place, uh, but we don't live there. We're our own separate and distinct community. We just want the same rights as everybody else. And then if I could, Senator, I just want to end with a comment. Um, as a Vermont representative, I think uh, we have a lot more important things to do here in Vermont uh, and, and not discussing uh, an issue like this that takes a lot of time for me to investigate the pros and cons of such an issue. Again, I think it's totally political um, right now with, uh, as you know, uh, all that's going on with uh, uh, the um, addition of possibly four members to the Supreme Court doing away with a filibuster on and on. Uh, I just uh, I think it's, uh, as you can imagine, uh, overly uh, political right now. And I see it as a, a completely political move in my mind. Thank you. Uh, let me, let me just, 
I, I mean, I, I certainly understand that. Right now, senators from Vermont have to spend a lot of time on issues governing the District of Columbia that they shouldn't. Uh, I would love nothing more than to be able to free up your Vermont senators to focus purely on Vermont's problems and get them out of DC's local affairs uh, and allow your state legislature to get back to focusing on that. But I appreciate the attention that we're getting today. Uh, there are times when uh, Americans have to come to the aid and speak up for other Americans. Uh, and I hope we can count on you to do that. But thank you for your comments, Representative. Representative Lefebvre. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for being here with us today. For those that are watching at home and may not have some of the background, um, and I know it's like some students are even watching today, could you give a brief um, history of how DC came about? Um, if we're looking to change more, could you just get a little background of how we got to where we, you know, how did we come about here? Thank you. Absolutely. The, uh, you know, the story became a little bit more famous with the musical Hamilton. Um, but uh, as big as a fan I am of the show, it left out kind of an important detail. And so there was this large dispute between the, 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 the Capitol was originally in Phil New York. It moved to Philadelphia briefly. Uh, and when President Washington first went to Philadelphia, uh, he became very frustrated that uh, as, as he took uh, enslaved people with him, the government of the Commonwealth of Philadelphia uh, was going to uh, emancipate them after six months because of the state's manumission laws. Uh, and occasionally his enslaved peoples would escape and the government of Philadelphia was not cooperative in returning what he considered his property uh, back to him. Uh, Jefferson and Madison and, and other folks who we associate with the spirit of liberty and freedom uh, also owned enslaved peoples. And so uh, it was important to the South that the capital be located uh, in an area that was uh, friendly and uh, to their idea of, of slavery. Now, they don't like to talk about that a lot and we kind of gloss over it, but that was one of the real primary issues. Uh, the, you know, and the North uh, really needed their revolutionary war debts assumed. Uh, because they were greater in the northern states where a lot of the battles were fought. And so that was the famous Great Compromise where George Washington got to pick the site of the Capitol. Uh, and he happened to pick it uh, right next to his uh, farm property, the plantation known as, as, as Mount Vernon. So uh, today, a land deal like that would probably have uh, special prosecutors looking at it. I don't want to... Uh, uh, in, insult the father of our country. It was a simpler time back then. Um, but the Capitol building was actually built by slave labor. The White House was built largely by enslaved people. Uh, and so slavery was an important part of, of Washington, D.C.'s uh, early history. Interestingly enough, though, in the first 11 years of the Capitol, federal representation was part of Washington, D.C.'s uh, existence. And so Maryland ceded a little land, Virginia ceded a little land. And if you lived in the Maryland part of the District of Columbia, you voted for and elected Maryland representatives who represented that part of the Capitol. In fact, in the third session of Congress, uh, Maryland was represented by a congressperson that lived and voted on behalf of his territory uh, within the boundaries of DC proper, same with Virginia. Congress took away the right of DC voters to be represented in 1801 by an act of legislation. And it, it, we have been fighting to get it back uh, ever since. DC has had various forms of local self-government, uh, including a territorial government in the 1870s for periods of time. But uh, for a long period of time, uh, DC residents couldn't even elect a, a mayor, a council, Congress was basically our government. They remain the upper chamber to our local government. Anytime we pass a law here that Congress disagrees with, uh, Congress can change it. Uh, and they have done that in a variety of issues, whether it was our early attempts at marriage equality uh, and equal rights for all, whether it was our laws on cannabis, whether it was a needle exchange program that we found effective in fighting AIDS and bloodborne viruses. Uh, Congress would occasionally step in and substitute their judgment for our uh, local folks. And so 
for a lot of us, DC statehood was always more about self-determination uh, and local control than it was federal representation. But uh, statehood as a bill uh, gives us both. Uh, and as Americans, we think we should have uh, both of those rights. Representative Lefebvre, any, any follow-up in terms of uh, background and history questions? No, I very much appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you, Senator, for being here. It is helpful just to have some background of, of uh, where you came from to be able to get to what you're asking now. Um, actually, I guess if I could have one more question. How, so for, for how many times or how frequently have you been asking for this? Uh, for, to be cut for statehood, you know, can you list off the years like we've asked for it here, we've asked for it here. Um, has it been something right along, um, you know, since 1801? You know, like how how many times have we seen this come in? Uh, you know, since you've lost the right, I know not since 1801, but you know, how many times can we see that you've been asking for this besides this year? Sure. Um, DC residents have been advocating for self government. Uh, ever since Congress took it away in 1801. The concept of statehood began in the late 1970s with the failure of an attempt at a constitutional amendment that would have changed how the federal district is treated. Um, there was a bill that passed both the House and the Senate and it went to the state legislatures and uh, 16 states ratified it, but uh, time expired. And so uh, we've really decided that the best course to do this truest to the Constitution was to keep a federally neutral seat of government and not take that away, uh, but simply to shrink it to the part of the district that's actually federal. And statehood was devised as a strategy that was both constitutional, consistent with the rights of state, and did not require uh, amending the Constitution because we're preserving that neutral seat. DC residents voted for it in 1979. We ratified a Constitution in 1982, uh, and we began electing uh, my positions to advocate and reaffirm our commitment to statehood beginning in 1990. In 1993, the House voted on a statehood bill. Uh, it did not pass the House, um, but we have been advocating consistently ever since. Uh, we have tried a variety of various uh, other methods. We would pair a House district with uh, Republican states like Utah. But at the end of the day, uh, statehood is the cleanest, most legal, most constitutional way to do it. Uh, Congress has the exclusive power to admit new states. It's done that 37 times. And um, it, it is the solution that DC voters have approved uh, most recently in the 2016 general election with a referendum on the ballot, uh, and they continue to reaffirm their statehood by voting for these so-called statehood or shadow uh, U.S. senators and U.S. representatives. Representative Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, welcome virtually to Vermont again, Senator Strauss. Um, uh, I think that any time that we have the ability to give equal rights and access to Americans, we should jump on it like uh, we're going to a fire. So I support this, but quite frankly, I have some reservations because DC surpasses only Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in the ratio of lawyers per capita. And that's, that's kind of a drawback. So, you know, in Vermont, we offer the nation maple syrup. So beyond the Constitution, the Bill of Rights and cherry blossoms and the National School for the Deaf, I guess, uh, what is DC gonna bring to the, to the party here? How many Hamilton tickets do you have access to is my bottom line question. It's firmly tongue in cheek as somebody that ate breakfast for about four years at 14th and G while I was a Pepco employee. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for that. Um... We, we, we hope to uh, do what we can to take our place. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that, it, that does come up <laughs> is that we're uh, primarily urban and uh, our economy is largely tech-based. And so while uh, we won't be competing with you uh, in the maple syrup business, 
uh, see our business and um, we'll be consumers of your agricultural products. Uh, we, we hope that we will continue to lead the way in tech innovations and uh, take our place that way. Uh, we're really so much more than a, a federal uh, city and uh, we have a dynamic economy that will help contribute when we become a state. We will be a donor state where we will contribute more to the federal treasury than we get out. And um, uh, we, we look forward to uh, being a full part of this democracy and this economy. Considering the bill that we passed last year, I'm a little bit hesitant on that agriculture consumption thing, but uh, we'll go with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Representative Gannon. Thank you, and thank you, Senator Strauss, for testifying today. Um, having worked in D.C. for over 20 years and now having a son who both lives and works in the District of Columbia, uh, I'm very sensitive about this issue and support this, this uh, resolution. Um, I'd like to, him to have the same rights I do. Um, unfortunately, he does not. Um, and I'm glad you raised the issue of congressional interference in local DC politics, even to the extent of, of changing its budget. Um, I, I think there are much better things for Congress to do um, than focus on a, a single area and, you know, make changes in its laws for, you know, whatever the political whims are in Congress at that time. Um, I, I think th that that's a waste of time. Um, to have Congress focusing on that. So I, I tr truly support this and, and I hope I hope we can move forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Representative LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator, for joining us today. Um, you've spoke a lot about the advantages to this happening. I'm just curious to know, based on the unique relationship that you've got with the federal government currently, um, what would be some changes that you would see? What is there a potential downside to this? Well, there there is to some extent because right now the federal government pays for our entire court system, and so all of our federal judges are federal appointees. So even the family court judges have to be nominated by the White House and confirmed by the Senate, and then their salaries are paid by well, you, the federal taxpayers, but. We would much rather pay the bill ourselves, appoint the judges ourselves, pass the laws ourselves. Uh, so we don't necessarily see that as a burden. We see that as uh, our fair share. Um, but I think that would be a boon to the taxpayers of Vermont because why should national taxpayers uh, be wasting time on our local, what would be the equivalent of our local state courts? So uh, other than that, no, I, we, we think most of the benefits would be positive. Uh, and ho hopefully, uh, when we do get to take our place uh, as voting members of the Senate and, and sending voting members of the House, um, we will not be the uh, Americans who understand government the least. We will come with our own ideas, our own solutions, and our own experiences and, and help uh, reason together uh, with the senators that you send and, and the senators from the 49 other states. Uh, to come up with solutions to some very severe problems that we're facing as a nation. Okay, um, thank you for that, Senator. So other than the court system, is there any other significant changes you would see happening because of the unique relationship that DC has with the federal government? Um, I don't, I see it really complements the federal government. Uh, you know, there, there are some federal programs that, that we get and, and benefit from. Uh, but they've also benefited your state. Uh, I mentioned that my daughter uh, was a proud UVM student, had a great experience up there. Uh, part of her tuition at UVM was paid by a federal program called the Tuition Assistance Grant Program. Um, and, and I don't know if that will continue or not. Um, every time members of Congress would try to cut that because it was seen as a, a benefit to DC students, they would hear loudly by chancellors of state university systems like yours, uh, that they benefited from, from those dollars coming there. But again, uh, if that happens, we have a dynamic economy, uh, even in these challenging times, it has grown. Uh, and so we balanced our budget in, at a time of uh, federal deficits ballooning. So uh, we're prepared to take on the financial responsibilities that we get uh, when, when we come with statehood and we expect to be good, responsible partners and being stewards of the federal economy. 
Uh, but we don't see it as anything negative. Uh, and, and I think it will benefit the federal taxpayers because you'll have a more independent and financially self-sufficient state joining you in the good. Thank you, Senator. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Senator Strauss. This has been um, a, a very fascinating lesson in um, the history of the District of Columbia. Um, we have in front of us uh, the language of our resolution and we're gonna shift gears and, and go to that now with our legislative council. So you're certainly welcome to, to stick around and, and um, uh, join us for that. Or uh, we also respect your time if you have other things that you need to attend to. But we do appreciate you Zooming to Vermont and I'm sorry that it wasn't in person and in celebration of your daughter's graduations. Well, I, I hope to get back there uh, soon enough. Thank you for uh, all the hospitality that the state has shown us. Uh, and thank you for uh, sending us Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders. Uh, they've been good partners. They've been good advocates for us. Uh, and when we've needed help, uh, Senator Leahy in particular with his role on the Appropriations Committee has had to solve a lot of the problems that some of his colleagues has created. And we're grateful for that help. Uh, and we would love nothing more than to get them off that duty and back to work full time for the people of Vermont. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll uh, mute the mic and, and hang on for a little bit. And uh, uh, when, when I slip out, uh, uh, quietly know that it's with uh, uh, appreciation for all of your time today. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Michael Chernick, thank you for being with us this morning. Um, you have uh, been part of the drafting process for this resolution and the next one we're going to look at. So um, I would love to take a look at the language right now. We all have the ability to call that up on a secondary device. So if you want to just walk us through uh, the text of the resolution, I would appreciate it. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Michael Chernick, the uh, one of the legislative staff counsel, and I was involved along with Amron in drafting this resolution. And it is JRH4. And I will go through the clauses of the resolution as follows. It's joint resolution urging Congress to admit Washington, D.C. into the Union as a state of the United States of America. Whereas the United States, and of course, the original sponsor was Representative White from Hartford. Whereas the United States Constitution, as ratified following the Constitutional Convention, of 1787 granted the right to vote for congressional representation to qualified voters in all the states, including those living in the sections of Maryland and Virginia that the District of Columbia Organic Act of 1801 designated as the nation's capital. And whereas the act removed this territory from the states of Maryland and Virginia, disenfranchising the District of Columbia's, the districts, citizens from exercising the fundamental right to vote for public officials. And for over a century, these American citizens could not participate in any local or federal election. And whereas in 1961, the 23rd Amendment to the United States Constitution gave the district's electorate the right to vote in presidential elections. And whereas in 1970, Congress enacted 2 USC Section 25A, authorizing the district's voters to elect a non-voting delegate to the United States House of Representatives. And whereas in 1973, Congress enacted the District of Columbia Self-Government and Governmental Reorganization Act, establishing the local mayoral and city council elections in the district, but Congress has repeatedly interfered in the local government's decision-making process, especially on budgetary matters. And whereas the residents of the district, also known as Washington, D.C., pay federal income tax, but are denied the full congressional representation of voting member of the U.S. House of Representatives and two United States senators that exist in each of the 50 states. And whereas D.C. Delegate Eleanor, uh, Eleanor uh, Holmes Norton and U.S. Senator Tom Copper of Delaware have respectively introduced the into the 117th Congress, HR 51 and S 51 to grant statehood to the District of Columbia. Now therefore be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives 
that the General Assembly of the state of Vermont supporting admit, supports admitting Washington, D.C. into the Union as a state of the United States of America, and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to President Joseph Biden, to the U.S. Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, to the U.S. House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, to U.S. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, and to the Vermont Congressional Delegation. And if I just may add in closing, I know to those two committees because those are the committees that have jurisdiction over the legislation involved. Uh, Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Michael, a question. Do you know how many other states have introduced such a resolution? I know a number, there certainly are at least, I'd say, eight or nine at a minimum. There may be more, but I believe it's somewhere in that range. I could be proven wrong, but I'm saying that as a bottom threshold as opposed to what the maximum is. There's been a national effort, and I know a number of other states have, and I was aware of at least eight or so at a minimum. Okay, thank you, Michael. Committee, any other questions for Legislative Council about the text of the resolution? All right. Excellent. Um, so we are going to shift gears now and look at a similar resolution uh, relating to the territory of Puerto Rico. And, um, and so, Michael, I don't know if you're planning I'm ready. to- I'm ready. It's here. Okay, great. Let folks uh, both follow. files on my desk, all set. And I um, should acknowledge that this was a team effort in both cases with Amron. We we worked together as a team. So this is uh, JRH nine, different topic, same concept, but different topic nonetheless. Joint resolution urging Congress to support statehood for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Whereas on July 25, 1998, during the Spanish American War. U.S. military forces invaded the Spanish colony of Puerto Rico, and whereas pursuant to the Treaty of December 9, 1898, which ended the conflict, Spain ceded Puerto Rico to the United States, and whereas the Constitution of Puerto Rico adopted in 1952 resulted in the jurisdiction's designation as a commonwealth, and whereas in 1917, the jones shafford Act granted Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship but unless they move to the mainland, they are unable to vote in U.S. presidential elections. And whereas despite its having a population over 3 million, representation for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico in the U.S. House of Representatives is restricted to a single resident commissioner who, unlike the representatives of the states, is prohibited from voting on legislation on the floor of the House, and the Commonwealth has no representation in the U.S. Senate. And whereas discussion of possible statehood for the Commonwealth has occurred since the 1930s, and whereas Puerto Ricans' dissatisfaction with the federal response to the massive devastation and approximately 3,000 deaths resulting from Hurricane Maria in 2017, and the still unsettled bankruptcy of the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority have intensified the debate surrounding possible statehood. And whereas although Puerto Ricans pay federal payroll taxes, their access to the services those taxes finance, including Medicaid, supplemental security income, supplemental nutrition assistance, and earned income tax credit is not equivalent to the extent afforded in the states. And whereas in 2012 and 2017, a majority of the voter voters in Puerto Rico favored a political status other than Commonwealth, and a majority of this subset of the electorate supported statehood. And whereas in a November 2020 referendum, 52.52% of voters in Puerto Rico supported Puerto Rico's immediate admittance as the nation's 51st state. And whereas in March 2021, U.S. Representative Darren Soto of Florida and Puerto Rico's resident commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez introduced H. 1522, the Puerto Rico Statehood Admissions Act, and Senator Martin Heinrich of New Mexico has introduced S. 780, a comparable bill in the Senate. 
and where a state who would provide the, Puerto, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico equal legal and political status with the 50 states, including full voting representation in the U.S. House and U.S. Senate. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives that the General Assembly urges Congress to support statehood for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, and be it further resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to send a copy of this resolution to the U.S. Representative, a U.S. Resident Commissioner for Puerto Rico and the Vermont Congressional Delegation. End of resolution. So committee, we weren't able to line up um, someone from the Commonwealth to share with us the, the history and the perspective of uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, we certainly will do that um, in a future meeting. Uh, but do you have any questions for legislative council for the, uh, the content of this resolution? Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Michael, I guess I would just like to ask if you know of any other states that are putting together a resolution similar to this. I believe there are others, but I can't speak as authoritatively as I can with respect to the DC where there's a, a national drive going on. Uh, the DC situation is a little different in that there was a basic draft circulating among the states. In, case, in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, Amron and I started developing this from scratch. Thank you, Michael. Uh, again, uh, I know even less about Puerto Rico than I, I do about uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know about Puerto Rico is when I was in the Seabees, my deck duty station was supposed to be to Roosevelt Roads, which was a naval uh, base there, but uh, I happened to be uh, transferred to another battalion and went to Diego Garcia. I guess that uh, naval base now is a public airport. Thank you. Representative Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and like the previous member, I, I have to admit I don't know enough about Puerto Rico as perhaps I should, but I am willing to learn. And I think if you wanted to send a delegation, um, maybe to Vieques or another place in Puerto Rico that we could learn more about the culture and the people there, and then report back to the committee, or maybe the whole committee should go actually. I see what you're saying, and I think that there would be tremendous value. So we should probably um, get in touch with the speaker's office and ask for permission for the committee to, to take a field trip on that. Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I might actually endorse that idea. I, <laughs> I'm always open to an education. Um, to, to Michael, I, I have a question, and I don't know if you would know this answer, but where you're talking about the 2020 referendum. Yes, sir. That there was 52.2%. 50, um, obviously, that was a, a national referendum. That was a, it was a Commonwealth-wide referendum. Uh, I point that in the resolution, that referendum out in particular, because in the two prior referendums, the language wasn't is necessarily clear, uh, and this line and this language in 2020 was a straight up or down. Should there be statehood? That was a clear question in 2020. So it was okay. a uh, Commonwealth wide. So the 52.2 percent. Do I read that that that's of all those who voted in the referendum? Or that is correct is that of, the, of the Puerto Ricans who voted in the referendum, 52.52% supported statehood and on what was okay. a clear up or down yay or nay question. And do you have any sense for how many of the registered voters participated in that particular referendum? I'm trying to get to, is this- that I don't, In terms of the percentage that voted that, I do not have right off the top of my head. Okay. Sorry. Because I, I have to say that that percentage is a little underwhelming. I'm, I'm sort of surprised it wasn't higher considering, well, potentially the upside. I, I've, I've heard that Puerto Rico, maybe they're really not in favor of this, but I just, it's only what I read on the internet. And of course, everything there I know is true. Thank you. 
<laughs> Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Funny, but I did happen to have just a few minutes this morning to look up some information on Puerto Rico. And I do have some of the information for Representative LeClaire. Um, so it was, uh, you know, that 53 to 47 percent of the people that voted. Um, there was discovered a large number of uncounted votes one week after the election, 170 briefcases with as many as three to 500 ballots were found after the election. Um, there is approximately 3 million people in Puerto Rico. Um, 600,000 uh, voted yes to that. Um, there was 37,000 that decided to cast their ballots blank, which is a Puerto Rican act of protest. So take that for what you will. But uh, again, I think that uh, that provision of the uh, resolution leaves a lot to be desired. <clears throat> Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I, uh, I don't usually trade in anecdotes or personal history, but in this case, I, I feel compelled to. Uh, in my youth, which uh, was some six decades ago, I spent quite a bit of time on the south side of the island <clears throat> outside of Ponce and in a barrio. Uh, and at that time, there was a stable governor who is uh, idolized in many ways to this day. But he presided over a rather bloody and uh, ongoing clash between the independistas and the uh, estados, the, the state people and the independence people. And that schism goes on, I think, well into uh, the 20th, first century. So again, when you read a referenda and the blank ballots, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's a very strong feeling against the uh, uh, the what they what the Puerto Ricans of the island perceive as their overseers, and so frankly, there's a contentious uh, division between statehood and independence, um, and I think that survives to this very day. I think most Americans that I know, uh, whether they just are tourists or expats or people in. Uh, <clears throat> the public arena uh, who operate businesses uh, or um, <clears throat> public institutions in the Caribbean would much rather see Puerto Rico uh, aligned with the United States than independent. So careful what you wish for, I guess, is, uh, is my uh, learning experience from long years ago. Thanks. Any other questions for legislative council around the text of the resolution? All right, well, there is more work to be done there, um, more perspectives to be considered for sure. Um, so committee, that is the end of our morning's work. Um, we do have one brief um, bill to come back to for, uh, for introduction right after the lunch break. And so I will see you back in committee at one o'clock. Representative Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think there's a vote that's held open um, for Representative McCarthy um, that Andrew reminded us of. Um, we could either take care of it now or after lunch. I just one. Let's, let's go ahead and do that. Is that related to Underhill? I believe so, yes. All right, let's get that on the record. Representative Colson, you're muted. Okay, I should call the vote. Um, McCarthy. Yes. Thank you. And that was the a yes on the Underhill Charter change. Just, just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah, H445. And, <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, the vote is 11 0 0. Excellent. I don't recall. Did we um, designate who was going to report that? Representative Higley. Oh, that's right. Thank you for volunteering. Volunteering. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, committee, for your good work this morning on um, 
on helping to craft the amendment to the uh, pensions bill and uh, and for your attention to the constitutional amendment and the two resolutions. Have a good lunch break and I will see you promptly at one. The sooner you get here, the sooner we'll leave.